Um, I ended up doing a lot with uh, tracking stolen devices. Um, I've also ended up training law enforcement on various investigative techniques, particularly uh, around social media. Um, I've even helped develop tools that are used uh, for um, uh, victim identification, um, helping to track child pornographers and tracking images and things like that. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how I developed those tools as well. Um, a lot of it just sort of, just out of curiosity, I started investigating these uh, different tools, identifying unique device identifiers, and I am able to draw connections, and I'll discuss that. Um, and then how that applies to the Internet of Things and what's emerging now and some, some of the concerns that I have um, around some of those issues. Um, and I, I prefer to be called a cyber criminologist, not a hacker. I'm a little offended by that. <laughs> Uh, so here are some images of people I've actually put in jail. Um, I blurred out the faces of the guilty. Um, I developed a laptop software that will capture photo using the web camera, uh, get location from Wi-Fi networks, gather other um, information to recover stolen laptops, uh, cell phones, cameras, USB flash devices. Um, I also then, uh, sort of created some custom Trojans uh, for particular devices, which I'll go through as well. Um, but um, what's really interesting about this is that many times, um, not only do we recover one device, but we end up um, finding a lot of other stolen devices as well. Um, in most of the cases, probably almost half of them, um, we re reveal uh, uh, firearms, drugs, identity theft, um, trafficking, you, know, you name it. Um, all sorts of different crimes we're able to help unveil as a result of that. So I uh, started out as sort of a reluctant hacker. I worked for a security company and I was very interested in USB-based Trojans. Um, I actually started a website called usbhacks.com where I talked about a lot of the different tools that are out there that took advantage of vulnerabilities in Auto Run um, and a lot of other issues we had with Windows XP um, that weren't actually patched until like what, two years ago, something like that still. Um, but these, uh, particularly malware, I was really interested in. I dug really deep, even built some of these own tools. And I didn't think there was enough awareness around it, so I created this website called USB Hacks. Um, that was the first time the FBI uh, contacted me. Um, <laughs> yeah. But once they realized what the purpose of it was to raise awareness. Um, and uh, I started developing these tools when I was working on my master's uh, dissertation, and I decided there's got to be a way to take this technology and uh, use it for good. Uh, what if you could actually sort of scale down sort of the nefarious um, actions that some of these um, applications took? Um, you don't um, have to necessarily put a back door into the system, but what if you collected just enough information to help recover a stolen device? Um, and that's what I had built. Um, and as a result, I had started a company, uh, it was called Gadget Track, um, and basically that's what we started with this flash drive. It was a free product we gave out there. Um, and it was free because I wanted to see how many devices it worked with. And I found that it didn't just work with USB devices, it also worked with um, external, dev um, external hard drives, uh, digital cameras, even GPS devices, because at the time, if you wanted to download um, your maps, you had to plug it in USB and it just uh, basically it's a big flash drive just hooked up. Um, so I found all these different devices that I worked with. Um, and then you know, shortly thereafter, um, I was able to actually start actually working with some of our customers and actually recovering devices. Um, I had one customer, that first customer, I called my, my first hunt. Um, he had a flash drive that was stolen. Uh, he was a professor at the university. Um, he had a lot of research information that was on that flash drive and he wanted it back. Um, we're able to identify that that uh, flash drive connected to a computer lab um, in the University of North Texas. And um, it was a particular computer lab, we were able to get a timestamp. We worked with the um, IT department there, so we were able to identify specifically what computer lab that was. But we still had an issue, we had IP address, we had general information, but nothing very specific. And so we started digging deeper and we found, well, actually to get into that computer lab requires a student ID card. Right? And so we get access to those logs, and they were able to, to correlate the logs, and they were able to identify who, who was in that room. That's still not enough, right? We have to identify specifically you know, who um, had access to that one room, um, and we need to be able to actually see their face, because sometimes a student, maybe they borrow their, each other's cards, right? That can be their defense. Well, uh, about a year before, they had a bunch of computers that were stolen out of that lab, so we got lucky. So we had some, uh, some video footage as well. So as people swiped their cards, we had video footage of them as they went into that room. Um, and actually, it's really interesting is that uh, many of the camera systems actually have log files. So actually doing log correlation with uh, different events, if you need to do that, like a, a rapid or um, you know, make it uh, automatic, uh, it's pretty easy to actually do. Um, and we ended up busting the, the kid uh, and we got the flash drive back to the customer. Um, then I was actually contacted by a, uh, a manufacturer of uh, very high-end thermal imaging devices. Um, these devices cost anywhere between $3,000 $3, to $300,000. 
Um, and not only that, they also have issues with these devices for export controls. Um, they're not allowed to be in certain countries, and they were having issues with some of their supply, their, uh, their partners who were doing the distribution, selling this to countries they're not supposed to. So, um, basically the, the malware would sit on the flash drive, we had to customize it so that um, even if you tried to remove the flash drive and put a new one in, um, it would rewrite it from the firmware, we would rewrite this uh, my particular application uh, to the, to, to the, uh, the memory card. Um, you insert that or connect the camera to a device and it will automatically phone home. Um, and they couldn't talk too much about some of the cases, but they did uh, say that it helped identify specifically one supplier. Um, we were able to pack fast enough unique uh, device identifiers to specifically map that to a uh, particular uh, reseller. So, um, and these devices were turning up in Iran. Hmm. So, um, you know, I, I got really interested in this and just, just the ability to sort of draw connections between devices. I find that just even the smallest piece of information can actually unveil quite a bit of information if you sort of look at what else they connect to, right? Sometimes we have all this information that's out there and it's just a matter of that one missing connection. Um, and I did a lot of research and I really uh, like this guy, his name's Edmund Lacar. Uh, he is sort of the grandfather of forensic science. Of course, he was dealing mostly with physical crimes. Um, and he had this uh, concept that uh, it's Locard's exchange principle, that every contact leaves a trace. And the idea is that when a crime is committed, um, the, the perpetrator leaves something behind and he takes something with him, right? So there's always pieces of evidence, it's just a matter of where we look. And in many ways he was actually, uh, this is before we had DNA evidence, this is before he sort of got into the fingerprints, he was doing a lot with uh, footprints and things like that. Um, and, and there's a, a lot of really interesting stories that he has. Um, but, but I was thinking, you know, this actually does apply to the digital world as well. Um, and many times it's just that we don't maybe have the technology right now, or we don't have, uh, we don't, we're, not, we're not sure where to look for that piece of information. And I'll talk about some cases. So we talk about uh, the interaction of things. Um, I like to classify my data in a few different ways. So, you know, there's data that we create, so there's something that's conscious. It's emails that we create, uh, contacts and tweets. It's information that we're publicly aware of, that we're creating, that we're putting out there. And then there's information that's created for us. So this is information when we, we interact with a website, it sends information back to us. Um, and, and with that, there's a lot of other data that we may not see, that we're not uh, aware of, that gets logged onto those systems. And that's where we get into the data that's created about us, right? So there's a lot of information that gets out there, and it can maybe something that's aggregated from this information as we interact with these devices, these screens. There's a, sort of this uh, data exhaust as a result of that. And then we have what I like to call shadow data. So this can be log data. It can be pieces of information that exist inside of, uh, as a, through the whole process that we may not even be consciously aware of. And the people that actually build the systems and the devices may not be fully aware that this information is out there and that it can actually reveal information about our, us and our activities as well. So when we look at this, when we look at the pyramid of data volume, this is a recent study. EMC found that, um, you know, there's, right now it's about 4.4 zettabytes, and I had to put the number, that's 4.4 trillion uh, gigabytes. I had to look it up, zettabytes. That's what we're into right now. It's crazy. Uh, so by 2013, and that's supposed to increase tenfold. And so what you actually see is that the, the information that we create and interact with and it's visible is very, very small compared to the, uh, the amount of information that we actually generate. So when we send an SMS message, right, to someone we love, that's it, it's just the SMS and then the other person sees it, right? Right? Wrong. There are over 20 log files that get generated for every single SMS message that you send, right? So then you have to wonder, you know, does the NSA really need to intercept my SMS message? What if they had access to, you know, just one of those servers that was collecting that log information, right? So you have to think about, where does our data live? So when I look at uh, information, so we have all these little pieces of information. Social security number, sure that identifies who we are. An IP address, that's another little piece of information. We get a device ID, right? Alone that doesn't tell us a whole lot. But as we start looking at all these different pieces of information, we start to see a profile. We draw those connections and we correlate that information and now we have a very rich profile and we can actually identify an individual. And those, those, uh, that data, those, the data actually gets generated from a multitude of different devices. And those devices are now interacting with other devices, right? When I connect a USB flash drive to a computer, there's a log that gets generated. There's a serial number that gets logged, and that's information I can extract. So as our devices interact with each other, they're sharing information about us. The machines are winning. 
So if we look at our devices as snitches, so when I uh, started developing tools, I actually uh, built a laptop product uh, that would actually uh, utilize a web camera, uh, would actually get location from Wi-Fi networks. Um, at the time, I was trying to figure out how do I get location, and then the first iPhone came out, and I'm like, that's amazing, it doesn't have GPS, how does it do it? Um, so I dug deeper and I found it was Wi-Fi geolocation. I uh, reached out to the company that was actually providing that technology and said, you know, can we do this for laptops? And uh, sure, you want to help us debug the, the API for that? And I said, yeah, that'd be great. Um, and so this is actually the first application where we were actually able to combine all that uh, information. So, you know, it wasn't the first time a web camera had been used for tech recovery tools, but it is the first time that a Wi-Fi location, a camera, and other information, including network data, was gathered. Um, so this was our, the first recovery I had, it was in Brooklyn, um, it, uh, it was an iMac that was stolen, um, and uh, you see here, there's a lot of other equipment that's in the background. Uh, we gave this to the police, and he couldn't believe that this was the case, uh, you know, I even told him, like, you know, the IP address, you know, we have location, and he's like, hey, uh, this isn't enough, you know, if I go to this location, how accurate is it? And I'm, trust me, just... Take the picture, go to that location, ask around if anyone's seen this guy. And he's like, don't tell me I to do my job, all right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so he did it, and what do you know, right? Uh, they go in there, and this was a tattoo uh, shop, and this is the back, this is the owner. Um, and in the back, you see all this other stolen equipment. Not only did they recover that iMac, they also found three laptops for different cases. Um, and now that cop's uh, a good friend of mine. He's like, hey, next time you're going to go play a, watch a baseball game or something together. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, so I mean, we talked a little bit about Wi-Fi, right? So I mean, imagine like back in the day we had Wi-Fi. We never imagined that that could be used to locate us, right? When we first started talking about Wi-Fi hotspots, now it's pretty common knowledge. Yeah, we know that that can be used to track us, and you know, uh, people are doing it commercially. So as that technology evolved, then it became intrusive in our privacy. So another case I had, um, there was uh, um, a bunch of schools were getting robbed in Portland, Oregon, where I'm from. Um, and I actually donated some of my software to the schools because they were getting hit repeatedly. It was the weirdest thing. They would get busted, they go buy new Macs, and then they get stolen again the, next, the week later. Like, what the hell, right? So we set up a, uh, some bait laptops that weren't even locked up in cabinets. We had six of them. We just set them out on top. And uh, sure enough, a week later, we started getting connections. Um, started getting information back. Those devices were stolen. And we got these interesting photos. Um, and again, we ran into some issues because geolocation is not 100% accurate. Um, you know, the police, they expect me to do everything, I guess. Um, but they went to there, and they went to the house, and it was a duplex. And uh, they went to one side of it, and um, the guy, the cop actually knew the guy. So the guy that worked on his roof. He's like, there's no way that this is the guy. Um, and I'm like, no, and trust me, I, I know. So I, I got pissed off, and I drove out there. It was in Vancouver, Washington. And I'm, I'm sitting there, and um, I'm getting a readout of all the different Wi-Fi signals in the area. Um, and out walks this guy from his house, and this, this the guy we have, you know, and uh, you know, a little scary, and I'm just sitting there like, oh shit, was, like I'm looking for directions on my computer, right? <laughs> I got my antenna, <laughs> but, uh, um, but you know, then, then I, I called the cops, and they, they came out there, the detective, and I talked to him for a while, and he goes, yeah, it's a good thing they didn't catch you, because you know, this guy's okay, but his friend that lives across the street, he's bad news. Um, you know, he's, uh, he was in for assault, and he's a huge, big guy, but anyway, uh, but it was another recovery. And this one, we actually, um, they didn't actually tell them our software was involved. Um, they got, um, there was like six or seven different guys that were involved in this crime ring, and uh, they got them to think that they'd all turn each other in, so it was pretty awesome. <laughs> I love this part of my job, it's great. Uh, we had another one where um, it was weird, it was a laptop that was stolen in Oregon and then we tracked it all the way to Missouri. I was getting uh, frustrated because it was about two weeks and I wasn't getting any connection. I'm like, oh man, they reformed the hard drive or you know, our software's not working, what's going on? And then we started getting tons of connections from this guy, Victor. Uh, he was nice enough to uh, change the username on the computer to his full name, which was nice. <laughs> really great of him. Uh, so that allowed me to do some more research on him. I found his MySpace profile. Um, he's a big Scion nut, um, and he actually uh, has a lot of um, usernames in different um, Scion groups, um, which uh, was nice because he had his car there, which uh, was great because it had his license plate number, which was really convenient. Um, he's also a big seller on eBay, where he was selling uh, various car parts. Um, and uh, then he decided to sell the laptop uh, to his friend um, Omar, um, and uh, as well along with a bike. Um, but the police got involved with this one. Um, we had enough information on them. Um, the district attorney actually said even if he doesn't have the laptop, um, it's enough for, to bust them for stolen property. So for us, that was sort of the first type of case like this, where even if he didn't have possession of the laptop, um, you know, 
it's, uh, he still can get busted. What happened with this was that uh, the laptop was actually given it was by his father. It was another theft ring. Um, they would actually uh, take a bunch of stolen property, put it into a van, drive it to, these are sort of a Russian organized crime group. Uh, there's a commune down in Missouri. They would drive it down there. Because where's the first place you're going to look for your laptop when it's stolen? Craigslist or local, right? You would never think to go look on Craigslist in Missouri. Um, so uh, then they would load that up with stolen property from there and they would ship it up to Portland. So um, another uh, ring that we ended up busting up just because of simple software and tracking IDs. So um, I'm not sure. I'm going to put my microphone up to here so you guys can hear this. Um, then I decided to get into mobile because I get bored. Two of the phones, there were two of them. Uh, one of them was that, that one residence, and then this one, uh, this was, ended up being a house of tweakers, which we have a lot of in Portland, apparently. <laughs> um, so the, they were able to run the records, and so the police were involved in this one again. Uh, again, we broke up about uh, half a dozen people were arrested, um, and not only did, um, and actually one of the guys, was uh, he was wanted on a warrant for something else, um, and they also recovered a stolen vehicle. Not the one they were driving, but they actually uh, were recovering another one. So. Um, the hard part about this case was that they, uh, for some reason, the GPS was, um, was actually disabled on the devices, um, but for some reason, the camera um, on one of them um, was still putting the GPS coordinates in the photos. Um, and then we actually encrypt those photos and upload them into um, the cloud. Uh, so we're able to get, still get the location for those devices. And so that led me to some more research. And I was really interested when we were doing the encryption of the images is um, the amount of information that's actually embedded. Um, you guys are all familiar with XF data. So information that gets embedded in it, you know, tells you the, you know, when it was taken, um, GPS coordinates, and a timestamp. And one thing I also found was that in really high-end digital cameras, it actually embeds the serial number in the make and model of the camera. So this got me thinking about um, other applications. Um, you know, how can we uh, make use of that? And I ended up building another tool. Um, you know, there was really no way to search for those serial numbers. Uh, so I built this um, basic. I was. Um, advising another startup that was sort of doing a, like a study at home type of thing where um, they had like thousands of computers and you would sort of lease out your um, computers that were unused, like a computer lab in schools, um, and let it run some processes, right? Um, so I wrote um, a little script that would actually go out and 
uh, go out and index Flickr, uh, all of Flickr. So it actually went and scanned every single one of their images um, and extracted all the uh, serial numbers and basically created a search engine for serial numbers for cameras. So the idea here is that if someone stole your high-end camera, um, you know, and then you see, you know, a month later that a photo gets posted um, in Flickr and you can map that to a username, I have this theory that we'd be able to catch, uh, catch a crook. Um, and uh, it was just more of an experiment, something we put out there for free, and it actually works. Um, <laughs> uh, so a little bit more how this kind of works. Um, so we ended up uh, creating this bot. It grabs, um, you know, data uploaded serial number, the make and model, the URL, uh, which we're able to get username from too. So that into this mega database, and then you can do a search on your camera, and it'll repack, return back any results. Also found that uh, not only did we do Flickr, but there was another one called 500 Pics, which is a professional photographer website, able to extract uh, the same data from Panoromeo, TwitPic, and Twitter. Although Twitter actually, uh, they either would scrub exit data from images you upload, I found that the profile photos, they weren't. Um, it even, it would be the weirdest thing, you'd have these tiny little icons, and there would be just tons and tons of this data, um, exit data that was embedded in the image, um, so we can get GPS coordinates, serial number, all kinds of other information. Um, I think they've, they've uh, since scrubbed that, hopefully. If not, sorry, Twitter. Um, so, uh, we actually, it was here in LA, uh, a professional photographer named John Heller. Um, he had a camera stolen. Um, he did a search. Um, it was about a year before, um, and he was able to get a, a hit. Found a, you know, some images were uploaded to Flickr about three months um, after um, it was stolen. We're talking like, it was between six to $9,000 worth of camera equipment. Um, and then we are able to trace that to a Facebook profile where uh, it was another professional photographer um, and he, he had a, a photo of all of his professional photo equipment. Photos of photo stuff, kind of meta, sorry. Um, and uh, so they got the police involved. Um, so what happened was that uh, he was at the Egyptian theater, the, uh, he you know, was talking to someone, turned around, his gear was gone. This thief had uh, taken it and then he sold um, the gear on Craigslist. Um, the guy that bought it from him on Craigslist ended up selling it later on eBay. Um, so the guy that actually ended up having it and had to give it up, wasn't, he wasn't a criminal at all, but he, had, he did have to get a lawyer. Um, and so they were able to recover that device. What's cool is that the, they went to the guy that um, had it on Craigslist originally. It was still in the same apartment they went in and there was all kinds of other stolen equipment there before. So when I talked about pieces of information, right, when we talk about Edmund Lacard, so there are traces there, it's just not necessarily we don't know where to look. Or new technology might evolve that will allow us to do that sort of um, that tracing, right? So it's only a matter of time. Um, so what's cool about this is that you know a lot of camera thieves are now uh, on notice that hey, you know some crime, something I steal today, that could come back to me two to three years later. Um, ended up doing a lot more with this. Um, had another guy that was in Virginia. He was moving to California. Um, you know he was selling uh, this high-end camera on Craigslist um, in the garage, and uh, someone. They, they came and they, they punched him in the face, took the camera, and they ran off. Um, we were able to uh, trace that to one particular guy. Uh, we were able to get his name, uh, his business. He was a professional photographer. I won't go into that too much. Um, and the DJ. Um, I was able to get his address from the domain reg registration for his business. Um, got his cell phone number, which he posted as well. Um, I was able to get into all the social media accounts. I ended up writing some scripts that actually goes out through QuickPick and everything and would extract any serial numbers, any GPS coordinates I could possibly find. Um, ended up getting a lot, a lot of photos. Um, and this guy was not very bright, so he liked to take pictures of weed, uh, his friend smoking weed, um, <laughs> posing with an unlicensed firearm, um, and uh, smoking weed, driving down the freeway, doing 120 miles an hour with his girlfriend. Cool thing is we have geolocation and timestamps, so we're basically, you know, felony here, felony here. <laughs> this is pretty awesome. <laughs> so, uh, privacy and security tips. So, um, one thing I found is, you know, the best way to secure your customers' data is just don't collect their story. Um, you know, especially nowadays, we don't know what can be used against you, right? Uh, especially all these new devices that are coming on board, what all this, all the login that gets generated. Um, really, I found when you're building applications, you know, what do you really need to store? Um, and you know, throw everything else away. Don't store it at all. Um, if you're dealing with images, um, you know, a good example is strip out any of the exit data. Um, if you do use it, anything, make sure it's just like something that's not critical. Maybe just the dimensions or you know, color profiles. Stuff that's important to a photographer. Um, uh, you know, most people that's, you know, aren't going to care about that. If you do store data, you know, encrypt as much data as you can. Uh, we actually built a backup service with our mobile um, um, application. 
And I was very paranoid um, about being compromised. You know, what if we back up people's photos and contacts and we get hacked? Man, that's a, like, that's a big issue, you know? I, I didn't trust my own ability to secure our servers. And I've been in security for so long, I'm like, man, one vulnerability and I'm, you know, I'm toast. My business is toast. And more importantly, our customers' the privacy is compromised. Um, there's a lot of other companies out there that don't have these qualms, right? They upload, you know, if you can view that image um, in their social, their, their interface, it's not encrypted. Um, so I actually built a tool where they would enter the privacy key in the application, it would encrypt the um, image and data before it gets uploaded to our server. So that way, even if, um, you know, that server gets hacked or um, some three-letter agency comes to me and they want your information, I can say, yes, here's the information, it's a big encrypted blob, they have to go to you to get that encryption key. And that also relieves me of some liability on the legal side, because um, I don't want to go to Guantanamo Bay. <laughs> so, you know, then it just happened to be that maybe I saw it in the future here, when we started seeing some of these new photos that were happening, right? Um, you know, people were saying the phones were hacked. Um, actually, I looked at the exit data um, in those images for research, only research. Um, and the point of compromise was it was an email, right? Um, you know, Chris Cheney, he got busted for it. Uh, he wasn't very smart. He was able to guess passwords, but um, he wasn't um, smart enough to not get caught. He's doing 10 years in prison. Um, and then we saw another case of that with Jennifer Lawrence and others. I think it was called, what, the Fappling or something like that, right? Um, where they were able to compromise iCloud uh, backups, right? If you think about backups, there's images, there's also a lot of other information that's embedded and that can be used against people. Again, it was bad passwords, no two-factor authentication, um, download backups and brute force them. You know, is this Apple's fault or the victim's fault? And I, I think it's a shared responsibility. Um, you know, I think um, the fact that Apple, you know, did, did a little bit more to help secure those backups, and that's a good thing. Uh, but we also need to be cautious about what information we are backing up in the first place, right? Uh, I don't think people um, are aware of the fact that when they do take photos, that it's not just on their device anymore, it's, it's spread out everywhere. And there's all different places that, that can be intercepted, where it can be stored, where it can be hijacked. Uh, another good example would be uh, <laughs> the snapping, um, which uh, with um, Snapchat, uh, where, yeah, sure, they say it's privacy safe, but um, there was uh, any, uh, a very insecure API, um, and they're still able to uh, store some of those information on an Apache server, and that got compromised. Um, and this is really messed up, too, because it's kids' images, right? Um, so this is um, it's very irresponsible, I think. So um, just be careful and, um, when you're building applications. Um, even app, a lot of applications or hardware that says that they're 100% secure, they're not. Um, you guys know about Black Phone? You guys hear what happened today? Yeah. There was a little bit of a vulnerability in just a simple SMS uh, tweak, and you are able to compromise a, a vulnerability. So um, be really cautious about that. Whenever I, I hear someone say that our application is 100% secure, I always think of the Titanic. Uh, protecting mobile device data. So um, check all third-party libraries or services used for privacy or uh, data leaks. So maybe you're doing the right things, but if you're using um, a third-party service, they may not. Um, especially when you're looking at advertising networks, if that's your, your road to monetization, um, it might be a good idea to audit that and see what happens, uh, what, what, um, where it's sending your customer's data. Um, I'm helping with a project that's uh, called uh, spyware.be. It's an uh, Android application. Um, it's going to be launched here in about a week or so. Uh, it's going to be free. Um, you can actually uh, sign up for a beta uh, uh, if you like to notif we'll notify you. Um, it might be cool if you're a mobile app developer to actually run your app through this. Um, but it's uh, spyware.be. And um, even with the development of this application, there were some privacy issues, right? Because they, they wanted a map. But um, if you actually look at Google Maps, if you want to integrate that into your application, the permissions that are requests we found were um, it was a little overreaching. Um, so it, um, it took a little bit of extra development to actually build off the own, uh, their own mapping here. The idea here is that nothing on this application comes home. So nothing that um, is runs on that application will send data out to a third party or to the other company. So you can actually run our app you know, to monitor the app, which is kind of bad again, sorry. Um, but it's not going to send any information out. It's not going to leak any data. Um, and what's great about this is it'll tell you, um, you know, uh, if there's been a GPS uh, check in by a particular application, um, what IP addresses um, or you know, app data is being sent to, how big is that data packet. Um, and the idea here is to make this very consumer friendly as well. And in many ways, what we're doing here is actually telling on um, app, app developers. So um, you're on notice if you're doing things that are invasive to other people, uh, their privacy on the mobile side. Um, this is going to get you at some point. That's our hope. And that's it.
Uh, you guys have any questions? I'm not sure how much time we got. 20 minutes? Wow, it's record time. Did I talk fast? Sorry. Any questions? You guys are quiet. Or you guys gonna go, you want to go drink, don't you? All right. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.